Welcome back, everybody, to the American Dairy Science Association meetings. Joining me today is Dr. Jonas D'Souza. He's with uh, Purdue Agra. Agribusiness. Agribusiness, all right. And we've also then got Jair Perales Giron. He's a student at Michigan State University. And my co host today, Carrie Estes. Hello. Good to see you. Good to have you back. Uh, Jair, you're going to be uh, talking to us about, uh, was it a paper or a poster? No, it, it, it's a poster. We did a presentation did this a morning, so it was a good presentation. A lot of people came for asking questions, so yeah. I guess we are going to continue Super. answering some questions. Yep. So the title was Determining the Relative Metabolizable Methionine Content of Rumen Protected Products and Their Effects on Production Responses. So uh, give me I an idea of the genesis or the inspiration for this trial. Yeah, I guess you can, you can, you can see this, this study as an idea to try to identify the bioavailability of four different products for making uh, decisions at an industrial level and as a company. So the idea was trying to use a methodology that is not that complex compared to other methodologies that has been developed before than this one and try to do it uh, as easy as possible for uh, doing um, for making those decisions okay and Jonas what was your role in this uh, study um, so at Purdue we we use a lot of uh, um, and give recommendations in terms of how how we drive milk fat and milk protein yield um, to the dairy industry and of course methionine is a big part of that uh, of those recommendations and and I can tell you every 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 time we see it, you know, you have these different methionine products in the market. So people ask, you know, what do you, what's the bioavailability of these? Do you think this number is really what it is or not? Um, so from our standpoint was, well, let's let's try to test, you know, um, from an anniversary standard um, with with high producing animals, um, what is the relative bioavailability of some of the products that are in the market? Okay. So that's okay. what we try to do. And how did you decide which products you run a test? That's a good question. Um, so it has, when we start thinking about, um, we decide to choose, basically you have different encapsulations of protection methods today, right? So, so, so you have the pH sensitive polymers, you have the encapsulation with different fatty acids. So, you know, you're always um, uh, concerned about, you know, how you really determine the bioavailability in some of these different methods, different protection methods. Uh, so that was kind of the basis for us. Um, so we choose two pH sensitive uh, products and two that are uh, fat, basically fat coating uh, methods um, on protecting them. And also, you know, we want to use relevant brands in the market that, that people were talking, people were using. So in a commercial situation, we had relevance to to, to, to the end user, you know, that information. Right. Very well. And Jair, uh, what was the basic protocol? How'd you set the trial up? Uh, first, we have to choose some uh, mid lactation cows. So we did a preliminary uh, period. So we worked with 36 uh, Holstein uh, cows and we have multis and print cows. So we selected them and we, blew, uh, and we, did, uh, we grouped them by uh, their uh, milk production during the during the prelim period, so we had uh, four uh, cows per uh, group because we did a Latin square design, and we have in total nine squares. So we selected them by the by the by, by the mean yield, and during that period, during the prelim period, we feed them a selenium uh, source for having a constant selenium flow to the mammary gland and assuring that the selenium was going to be the same for all the cows. But got it. Yeah. Very well. Carrie, looks like you've got an Yes, question. I do. Yes. So as you know, feed and mixing stability, that's a pretty crucial piece for determining viability of any Rubin protective product. So mm -hmm. did you, how did you handle these products before they got to the cow? Did you mix some? Yeah, we, we, we know that uh, that's a really hot topic about how are you going to feed the methion into the, to the cows. So we did a mix. We use ground corn for putting the, all the supplements in ground corn. And we use that mix in the TMR. So the idea was giving the, uh, the, the, the mixes and giving the products to the cow in a constant manner. That's why we did that. And you fed once a day? Once a day. Okay. 
Okay. Yep. Yeah, just, you know, to comp, I think your question is, is really relevant in terms of methodology. Um, we do, we did try this try to be as close to the field as you can, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what we try to, but we also know that some methionine sources, you may have some fragility issues when you run through some special mixes. So basically, you know, what we did is a four pound premix of that methionine source. And then mm -hmm. it was, it was, it was a mix again of the TMR and then fed once a day. So the idea is let's, do, let's deliver the, the, the methionine at closest to the field conditions as we can. Mm -hmm. So that was that was one of the objectives. Yeah. And we we think depending on the methionine source that you're using, you know, maybe you're penalizing some sources or other mm -hmm. because of their method of delivering if you're using post dose or if you're using like a straight uh, top dress type of mixture. So that's why we decided to do that way. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And then my other question I had was um, about the technique itself. So as I know you all are aware, there are so many different methodologies, right? Especially for amino acids to assess bioavailability. So what about this technique makes it, I want to say superior to the other techniques that are out in the industry today? I, I guess the most important part about the technique is how easy it is to run it because the only thing that we need to do for uh, developing and for uh, running the technique at the farm level is feeding the selenium, feeding the selenium, the selenium source during an, uh, an estimated time. And after that, we are going to be analyzing the milk of those cows for selenium, and we are going to be doing total nitrogen. And those kinds of analysis are analysis that are really easy to do in a lab. So compared to other techniques, the other techniques involve uh, the use of in vitro bags and the washing. And some, some of the other techniques involve using a radio label methionine or you need to bleed the cows. So we think that with this one, the only thing that you need to take and collect is milk. And that's something that you are doing every day at the farm. So for us, uh, we think that that's pretty convenient. So do you think people could run this technique on the farm, like not in a university type environment? Yes, I think it's doable, but of course people need to do some training because we are working with selenium and the cross-contamination with minerals is really easy when we are uh, talking about samplings and samplers. So the only thing that I need to be pretty careful is about cleaning the samplers in the most proper way for avoiding that cross-contamination and for having uh, the sample that we want. Jonas, I think your company uses this uh, methodology to make some business decisions. So mm -hmm. I'm going to guess you have some level of confidence in it. Would you mind give us an idea of, of you know, how consistent do you think it is? How precise is it? Um, can you speak to that a little very, bit? Very good question. Carrie really is trying to get us in trouble here when she asks <laughs> us to compare <laughs> techniques, right? Um, <laughs> But uh, I, th I think the point is um, understanding the technique has, uh, has its value when we try to disrupt less that normal feeding schedule, right? It's a less invasive procedure. Like when you start bleeding cows too often, you know, how you change those partition of amino acids and how, how you know, in terms of uh, immune system, how really it affects the, the animal, we don't know, right? We made all these assumptions. So I think that's the benefit of the technique. Um, in terms of, uh, of making a uh, business decision, uh, one thing that we always wonder and we try to do in this trial is, is not only what that bioavailability is, but what's the variation around that bioavailability. Because you can have a bioavailability of 50%, it varies from 10 to 90, uh, you might be in trouble, right? Um, so, so that's I think is another good point of uh, what we try to do here. We try to use more cows, you know, using 36 uh, cows, and uh, you know, Latin Square gives you a lot of power. Uh, if you see what we did, and it, try to estimate that error using Monte Carlo simulation. So, in terms of business decision, I would say don't look to the only to that bioavailability number. Well, look to the variation around the bioavailability number when you make decisions. Um, and I think that's pretty important. Uh, and that's what we try to, ass to assess with these trials. Um, and that's from, from basically, if you think when we set up the trial, um, um, we, use, we use as payload the manufacturer recommendations. Uh, and you can see the, the response of the animals and the bioavailability estimate. So I would say 
from from the sources that you use to be a, a pre uh, within what we expect you know with the manufacturer combination only one source would be uh, out of the of the, the combination based on, on on this experiment right um, so the technique allows that and I think not only evaluating the bioavailability or the relative bioavailability but what's what's that range is is, is really the key yeah. So just a real quick question. I, I believe one of the uh, treatments was Immunisure XM, of course, uh, marketed by Balchem. And so I don't want to talk about the other ones, but can you can you tell us, was, was Immunisure XM one of the three that did meet the uh, manufacturer's requirements? It was, it was, it was. And yes, you can see the error as well. This was um, um, within recommendation. So I think the technique allows us to do that quite well. And as I said, in the fitting situations that we did, I think when you use a fat protection mechanism, maybe sometimes you were penalizing that by using different methods. So, um, and, and basically, um, it was one of the, that was within um, your manufacturer specifications. Good, very well. I think Clay did a good job when he, uh, when he put those specs together. Oh, he's, <laughs> he's on track. He's on track, all right, um, very well. So, are there any other uh, key learnings, key things you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, no, I, wrap things up? I guess, I guess this is a technique that is really easy to use. If you are gonna want to see, as Jonas said before, the consistency of the, of the supplements that you are going to be using at your farm, this is really easy to do because, as I told you before, selenium or nitrogen are kind of a common analysis that some labs used to do. And as I told you before as well, milk, cows are producing milk every single day. And that's the sample that we use for running this method. So this is something that is really easy to do. And of course, it's going to have all the outputs that Jonas told us that is going, it's going to give us a clearer uh, a scenario about the quality and the cons consistency of the products that we are going to fe be feeding to our cows. Yeah, excellent. Well, listen, I want to thank both of you guys for uh, stopping by, spending some time with us today here at the Real Science Exchange, and I hope to see you next time here where it's oh, always happy hour and you're yeah. always among friends. Thanks it's for... Good. We're not drinking today. Thanks for having us, <laughs> and it was my favorite podcast, so, yeah. Oh, yeah, good, Happy good. to do it. Well, let's hope it's not your life. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. Stop. Thank you. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars. Mm -hmm.